See how this looks. Okay, I ain't got you, so you ain't in it at all. So ooh, do I need to get rid of that? Let me see. Oh, the glare is coming through the lamp, man. Where's With his light. Well, shalom, everyone, and welcome to our Shabbat Shalom service, August 12th, 2022, and we are excited about everything that's going on in our lives. It's a very special day for my wife and I, because we are we're married on this day, and we have just completed our 56 years. So from this point on, we're going toward 57. So we we are excited. We're going to have our class. And then we're going to go walk on the beach and have a great time here in Laguna, California. So we thank you for joining us and get ready. We're going into lesson 47, title Ray, R-E. E-H, which means to see, but it's a different kind of sight. It's the kind of sight that deals with perception. In other words, there's more to it than just what the eyes see. You're kind of governing what the eyes are relating to the mind in terms of what you're looking at. So that's called a perception. So two of us can look at the same thing and see something completely different because of our perception of what it is we're looking at. And so re'e means like perception or, or a knowing of a type that involves information and what you're going to do with that information. So we are excited about this lesson on tonight. Uh, long lesson. I believe we can finish it in one hour, but I'm not certain. Uh, before we begin our lesson, we're going to wait for a couple of more people to join. Before we begin our lesson, we're going to have our communion on our Shabbat night. And we'll have that shortly. We're listening to this music. We don't own the rights to the music, but we just use it to get our hearts and minds ready to receive all that the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, is speaking to us on this night through the Torah. So enjoy the music and let's get ready for a wonderful time in the Lord. You might get a little bit of a glare behind me because I'm trying to shut everything up because I was picking up a glare on the camera, a glare with the light behind me and a glare with the uh, window. So I had to close the blind. We're in, as I say, we're in this hotel. Now to close the blind, I believe this lamp over the desk area is going to be sufficient. At least it is for this side of my place which is the left side, and the right side is going to be kind of dark. But when I turn a lamp, let me turn one more lamp on and see what happens. Okay, that lights up a little bit, that wall behind me, so it doesn't look so dark. Okay. Well, that will be good. All right. All right, we're going to shut our music out. 
so we can get started on our lesson. I'm going to shut my phone off because I just received a call from my godson wishing us a happy anniversary and birthday and everything else. And so I'm sure we're going to get other calls. We've been receiving messages all day today, and we thank each and every one that has given us a happy anniversary or happy birthday. So we we thank you so much. And let us get ready for our lesson. All right, we're going to get ready for our communion. After we pray, let us pray. Jehovah our Elohim, we bless you for this day. This is the day that you have made and we rejoice and we're glad in it. We thank you for the specialness of this day as it was on this day that my wife and I were married over 56 years ago. So we just bless you now and we praise you for this opportunity to study your word together. We thank you for the blessings that you bestow upon each one as they join us tonight for this walk through the Torah in one year. We bless you and we yield these earthen vessels to be filled with your presence. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen. All right. So with that, we're going to get ready for our communion. Get your communion uh, elements together. And we know that our Messiah Yeshua on the night before his death gathered the 12 together uh, in, the, in a room and he first, after the meal, he took bread. It would be made round like a pizza loaf. But he took the bread and he broke it. And then he passed it around the room and each one was told after he blessed it, and he would bless it with the Hebrew blessing of Baruch Atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech Ha'alom Ha'motzi Lahem Lamin Ha'aretz, which means, blessed are you, Yehovah Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he told them to eat of this. He said, eat, for this is symbolic of my body, my body that is broken just for you, and they ate. Then he took the cup, the cup of redemption, passed the cup around the room until after he blessed the father, he said, Baruch Atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaAlom Borei Pari Hagafein. Blessed are you, Yehovah Elohim, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. And he told them to drink of this. He said, for this is symbolic of my blood, my blood that is shed for the remission of your sin and for a new relationship with me. And he told us to do this often always in remembrance of the price our Messiah paid. And so we drink. So with that, we're gonna close our shared, we're gonna get our shared screen. I said say open our shared screen. And we're going to get into our slideshow presentation. Let me take this. Get into our slideshow presentation. Yes, because it's kind of a long, as you could see, it's a long chapter. I mean, a long lesson because we're going from Deuteronomy 11, verse 26 to Deuteronomy 16, verse 17. So we want to get into this and to get started. So we start our slideshow and we began our presentation. This is lesson 47 of 52 lessons through the Torah in one year. So we got five more to go. 
and we will have completed one year, in one year, the first five books of the Bible with the Hebrew explanation as best as we've been able to learn it and to translate that, transfer that information on to you. So, um, let's begin our lesson. We're going to introduce it. Remember I told you that word, re, which means see, is a lot more like perception because it's based on your values of all that you're seeing. And that will determine what you will do then with what it is you see. So with that, let's begin our get our into our introduction. In this week's reading, which is called A, Moses continues. Remember, he's addressing the children of Israel before he is to go up on a high place and die. Because he's not allowed to go in to the promised land or the land of Canaan that will become known as Israel. So he's been blessed with the opportunity now to teach the people based on what he has taught them in the Torah, his perception of what he's actually teaching them. So once again, we see this way A or this perception or Moses is taking what he has learned through his teaching of the Torah and presenting that information uh, in his own words to the children of Israel and for us today. Just before the Israelites cross the Jordan and enter the land of Israel, Moses commands the Israelites to proclaim certain blessings and curses on Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal after they enter the land of Israel. He directs them to destroy all vestiges of idolatry from the promised land. This is why he told them to destroy all these things, because they, they are not to be in this land that he has set apart for his people. They must then designate a city where the divine presence will dwell in the holy temple. And we know that later on, that was fulfilled through David as the temple under the direction of Solomon was built in Jerusalem. We see that Re'e means see, but it's different than just the sight. It's also the values of what you're placed on what you're looking at. So he says that what it, it makes it seem like there is a, he's letting us know that there's a difference between a blessing and a curse. And we understand that. But what we see, however, is not a result of what we're looking at, but a function of who we are. How many times in your life have situations that you thought to be blessings turned out to be a curse or vice versa? Seeing in the difference between a blessing and a curse requires knowing what they in fact are. Remember, Jehovah always instructs us prior to testing us so that we will know what we understand about the information that he has given us. And how do we know? How do we know the difference? By learning what a blessing or curse is in the eyes of Jehovah, our Elohim. By seeing reality, not through our subjective and distorted eyes, but through a godly lens. This is your perception as revealed to us through the Torah. So we're supposed to see things in the manner in which Jehovah has desired for us to see that very thing. And we began our lesson. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 25. Me beginning with verse 26. See, he says, Ray, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you listen to the misvote of the commands of Jehovah, your Elohim, that I am giving you today. Remember, that's like that Shema. You're listening with the intent of obeying. So that's shaping your perception, your intent to obey what Jehovah has instructed us to do. And the curse, if you don't listen to the commands of Jehovah, your Elohim, but a turn aside from the way I am ordering you today, 
and follow other gods that you have not known. So through disobedience, you're basically either becoming your God or Satan becomes your God. When Jehovah your Elohim brings you into the land you are entering in order to take possession of it, you are to put the blessings on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. So he's going to separate the tribes into the same number on the east or on this particular mountain called Gerizim. And then the other six tribes will go on the mountain of Ebal. And then they're going to pronounce the blessings on Gerizim and the curses on Mount Aval. Both are west of the Jordan. Remember, he's on the east side of the Jordan. When they cross over, they're on the west side of the Jordan. That's where they will be. When, and he said, both are west of the Jordan in the direction of the sunset in the land of Canaan, the Canaanites living in the Arva, across from Gilgal, Gilgal near the pistachio trees of Moray. For you are to cross the Jordan to enter and take possession of the land Jehovah your Elohim is giving you. You are to own it and live in it. And you are to take care of, to follow all the laws and rulings I am setting before you today. And with that, we get into chapter 12. Here are the laws and rulings you are to observe and obey in the land Jehovah, the Elohim of your ancestors, has given you to possess as long as you live on the earth. So Moses is saying that this land was set aside for the children of God, and that is where the children of God will reside for as long as as we live on this earth. That is in the future. You must destroy all the places where the nations you are dispossessing serve their gods, whether on how mountains or hills or under some leafy tree. You have to destroy every vestige. This is what? This becomes what we call the holy land. So you can't have other idols in this land. He said, break down their altars, smash their standing stones to pieces, burn up their sacred poles completely, and cut down the carved images of their gods. Exterminate their name from that place. This is the holy land. And only the name of Jehovah is to be reverenced and spoken of in this land. But you are not to treat Jehovah, your Elohim, this way. Rather, you are to come to the place where Jehovah, your Elohim, will put his name. In other words, we know that that is going to later be Jerusalem. He will choose it from all your tribes. So we know that it came from the tribe of Judah. And you will seek out that place, which is where he will live, and he go there. You will bring there your burnt offering, your sacrifices, your tents, the tithes that you set aside for Jehovah. The offerings that you give, the offerings you have vowed, your voluntary offerings, and the firstborn. Remember, the firstborn are to be brought to the temple, and they are reclaimed or redeemed back to the family through the paying of the five shekels. With that, we continue verse with verse 7. There you will eat in the presence of Jehovah your Elohim. You will rejoice over everything you set out to do. You and your households in which Jehovah your Elohim has blessed you. So this is the, when you come there these three times of the year, when the people were together in the temple to what? Come before Jehovah. When you come to that place, it's to be a joyous time. Because you're praising Jehovah for all that he's done for you. And everybody is going to partake of this together. You will not do things the way we do them here today, where everyone does whatever in his own opinion seems right. Remember, because the temple is in the midst of them. The tabernacle is set up in the midst. But now they're going to be scattered all over the land. And Moses is telling them, right now you... You got this right in front of you. But it's when you're in, you've taken the land, and then you have to come from the north to south and the east to get to this city. 
then we're going to see if you're going to do what Jehovah has explained that you were to do, instructed you to do. He said, because you haven't yet arrived at the rest and inheritance with Jehovah, your Elohim is given. So he promised them a rest through obedience after they take the land. He goes on, but when you cross the Jordan and live in the land Jehovah, your Elohim is having you inherit, and he gives you rest from all your surrounding enemies so that you are living in safety, then you will bring all that I am ordering you to the place Jehovah, your Elohim chooses to have his name live. Your burnt offering, sacrifices, tents, the offering from your hand, and all your best possessions that you dedicate to Jehovah. And you will rejoice in the presence of Jehovah, your Elohim, you, your sons and daughters, your male and female slaves, and the Levites staying with you, inasmuch as he has no share of inheritance with you. So even the Levites are coming to this place on these three times, these three festive occasions, when they are not serving at the, at the temple, they will come as well. Verse 13, be careful not to offer your burnt offering just anywhere you see. So you have, only at the temple can you do this. But do it in the place Jehovah will choose in one of your tribal territories. There is where you are to offer your burnt offerings and do everything I order you to do. However, you may slaughter and eat meat wherever you live and whenever you want, in keeping with the degree to which Jehovah your Elohim has blessed you. The unclean and the clean may eat it. Now, that's not talking about the food. That's talking about a person that may not be clean at that time. In other words, maybe a, a woman doing her menstrual cycle or a family that has experienced death. You can still eat this meat. It's the holy meat that you cannot eat during that period. So he says, as it were, a gazelle or deer. But don't eat the blood. Pour it out on the ground like water. Not to eat or drink the blood. Pagan practices were drinking blood, not only of animals, but also of humans trying to bring forth life or imitating this life. But Jehovah says we were never to do that. We go on. You are not to eat on your own property the tenth of your grain, the new wine or olive oil that you set aside for Jehovah. That's your tenth. You don't bother that. He says, or the firstborn of your cattle or sheep, or any offering you have vowed, or your voluntary offering, or the offering from your hand. So you cannot do that. Those must be done at the temple. No, he says, verse 18, you are to eat those in the presence of Jehovah your Elohim. Remember, for many other offerings, other than the sin offering, part of that animal would be eaten by the priest and part by the person who made the vow or was asking for the blessing. They would then share in the eating of that at the temple where well, there wasn't any way to preserve it until you got all the way back to where you were living. So they would have a festival and eat that there. He says, he says, and go on, you and your sons and daughters are to eat with you there, the male and female slaves, and the Levite, who is your guest. And you are to rejoice. This is all a joyous occasion before you hover your Elohim and everything you undertake to do. Verse 19, as long as you are living on your property, take care not to abandon the Levite. Levite. So he keeps going over this because the Levites share. There's a special, every three years, the offerings, the tenth go uh, a special tenth goes to the Levites because their job was to study, to study the Torah, to keep the understanding, to be part of the judges that were in the land. That was their job, and so there was not to be any distraction from that work. And so, by giving this part of your blessing to the Levites, then you help them to help you. He goes on, verse twenty. When Jehovah your Elohim expands your territory as he has promised you, and you say, I want to eat meat, simply because you want to eat meat, then you may eat meat as much as you want. If the place which Jehovah your Elohim chooses to place his name is too far away, then he's going to begin to tell you what you should do concerning that tent that might spoil or something like that. He goes on to say,
He says, you can eat it as you would a gazelle or deer. The unclean and clean alike may eat it. Once again, that's not the animal, that's the person. Just take care not to eat the blood, for the blood is the life. You are not to eat the life with the meat. Don't eat it, but pour it out on the ground like water. Do not eat it so that things will go well with you and with your children after you as you do what Jehovah sees as right. That's a very important concept. If you want to know what is right and what is not wrong, right or wrong, then look at the Torah and find out what does Jehovah say about this. We go to the word and that's where the standard comes as to what is right and what is not right. Not at the word, something we make up because we say we perceive the Torah in this way. Because why? It will be confirmed in two or three places what that is. You can't just read one section and think you know. You have to go through and search out the scriptures so that you can get more meaning as you, Moses is adding meaning to what has already been taught in the book of Leviticus or Vayikra. So we go on. Only the things set aside for Elohim, which you have, and vows you have vowed to make, you must take and go to the place which Jehovah will choose. So we know that that is, in fact, the temple. That's where you were to go for that in that situation. But if your animals were, you were afraid that your animal couldn't make this long journey and you didn't feel like you could make that journey, then Jehovah makes a way in which you can handle that situation. Let's go on. There you will offer your burnt offerings, the meat and the blood on the altar of Jehovah your Elohim. The blood of your sacrifices is to be poured out on the altar of Jehovah your Elohim, and you will eat the meat. Verse 28, obey and pay attention to everything I am ordering you to do so that things go well with you and with your descendants after you forever, as you do what Jehovah sees as good and right. When Jehovah your Elohim has cut off your enemies ahead of you, the nations you are entering in order to dispossess, and when you have dispossessed them and are living in their land, be careful after they have been destroyed ahead of you not to be trapped into following them. This is holy land. So those things, those the way they worship their God, Baal and Ashtar, those things you are to destroy and blot out from the land because this is holy. I want you to do, he says, you must not do this to Jehovah your Elohim, for they have done to their gods all the abominations that Jehovah hates. They even burn up their sons and daughters in the fire for their gods. So Jehovah is saying this is holy land and that things must be done in the manner in which Jehovah has designated for them to be done. Remember, the earth and everything in it belongs to Jehovah, our Elohim. We go now to chapter 13. Everything I am commanding you, you ought to take care to do. Do not add to it or subtract from it. This is why the Levites were supposed to study the word and teach the people the word. Problem is, build a tent around the word, a wall around the Torah, but that wall was comprised of man-made rules and traditions. And so therefore they began to distort the understanding of the Torah. Now we're gonna get into prophetic. If a prophet or someone who gets messages while dreaming arises among you, and he gives you a sign or wonder. And the sign or wonder comes about as he predicted when he said, but let's follow other gods which you have not known and let us serve them. So it, it letting you know here that a false prophet can have a sign that would make one think that that's a true prophet. But Jehovah says, go to the word, study. He says, as we go on, you are not to listen to what that prophet or dreamer says. Why? For Jehovah, your Elohim is testing you. In other words, Jehovah has allowed this, had done this sign for them, but 
What they're telling you is born out in the Torah to be incorrect. In order to find out whether you really do love Jehovah your Elohim with all your heart and being. You ought to follow Jehovah your Elohim. In other words, he's testing you to see if you can, what? Discern Jehovah from the, what? Counterfeit. And remember, counterfeit is so close that you would think, hmm, that is real. But Jehovah will point out to you that that is false. He says, you are to follow Jehovah your Elohim, fear him, obey his command, listen to what he says, serve him and cling to him. And that prophet or dreamer is to be put to death because he urged rebellion against Jehovah your Elohim who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from a life of slavery in order to seduce you in order to seduce you away from the path you're over your Elohim ordered you to follow. So this false God is trying to take you away from this counterfeit, what is the truth? He said, this is how you are to rid your community of this wickedness. So when you understand that, that was why the job of the Levites was so important. When you understand this, every one of the kings, especially of Israel, had all these false prophets standing around him. Ahab and Jezebel had 900 sitting at the table, false prophets, teaching about Baal. All of these things, Jehovah is telling you, you the Levite was supposed to help protect you from that by teaching you the truth. He says, even if your brother, son of your mother, or your son, or your daughter, or your wife whom you love, or your friend who means as much to you as yourself, secretly tries to entice you to go and serve other gods, which you haven't known, neither you nor your ancestors. This is after you come into the land and have been there a while. The gods of the people surrounding you, whether near or far away from you, anywhere in the world, you are not to consent and you are not to listen to him. And you must not pity him or spare him. And you may not conceal him. Rather, you must kill him. Your own hand must be the first one to put him to death. Remember, that was done by stoning. And afterwards, the hands of all the people. So remember now, many of the things that Yeshua would do, even though the sign would follow, you can see that the priests, through their interpretation of what had taken place at that time, would tell the people that this was not a sign from Jehovah. It was a sign from Satan. And they were not to follow Yeshua. But Yeshua would tell them that you know the word and you know that the word that, he, that I speak are of my father. And so therefore, it, what I am saying is not false. What you're saying is false. He said, so the people were picked up stones and were going to stone him because of what the religious leaders said that Yeshua was doing. He said, then when you do that, all Israel will hear about it and be afraid so that they will stop doing such wickedness as this among themselves. We go on, verse 13. If you hear it, whoop, if you hear it told that in one of your cities which your over your Elohim is giving you to live in, certain scoundrels have sprung up among you and have drawn away the inhabitants of their city by saying, let's go and serve other gods. <clears throat> or, excuse me, which you haven't known, or what else would they do? They would build an image and say, that is the image represents Jehovah, same thing. Then you ought to investigate the matter, inquiring and searching diligently. If the rumor is true, if it is confirmed that such detestable things are being done among you, you must put the inhabitants of that city to death with the sword, destroying it completely with the sword, everything in it, including its livestock. Keep all its spoils in an open space and burn the city with the spoil to the ground for your over your Elohim. It will remain a tale or a cursed place forever and not be built again. None of what has been set apart for destruction is to stay in your hands. Then Jehovah will turn from his fierce anger and show you mercy, have compassion on you and increase your numbers as he swore to your ancestors. 
provided you listen to what Jehovah says and obey all his commands that I am giving you today. Thus doing what Jehovah your Elohim sees as right. Chapter 14. You are the people of Jehovah your Elohim. You are not to gash yourself or shave the beard above your uh, uh, and your foreheads in mourning for the dead, because you are a people set apart as holy for Jehovah your Elohim. Jehovah your Elohim has chosen you to be his own unique treasure out of all the peoples on the face of the earth. So you don't practice these worldly practices and bring that into the lifestyle and the culture of the children of God. You are not to eat anything disgusting. The animals which you may eat are the ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle, roebuck, ibex, antelope, orcs, and mountain sheep. Any animal that has a separate hoof. Remember, we went through this carefully in the book of Leviticus, Vaiqua, that is completely divided and also choose the cud. These animals you may eat, but you are not to eat those that only chew the cud or only have a divided hoof. For example, the camel, the hare, the coney are unclean for you because they chew the cud but don't have a separate hoof. While the pig is unclean for you because although it has a separate hoof, it doesn't chew the cud. You are not to eat meat from these or touch their carcasses. Of all that lives in the water, you may eat these. Anything in the water that has fins and scales, you may eat. But whatever lacks fins and scales, you are not to eat. It is unclean for you. You may eat any clean bird, but these you are not to eat are the eagles, vultures, ospreys, kites, any kind of buzzard and any kind of raven, ostriches, screech owls, seagulls, any kind of hawk, little owls, great owls, horned owls, pelicans, barn owls, coronauts, storks, any kind of aeron, hopses, and bats. All winged swarming creatures are unclean for you. They are not to be eaten, but all clean flying creatures you may eat. You are not to eat any animal that dies naturally. Although you may let a stranger staying with you eat it or sell it to a foreigner, you don't touch an animal that's what that's dead that makes you unclean. Therefore, you are not to eat it. But a person that does not come into the understanding of Jehovah, your Elohim, if the animal dies and they want to eat the meat, then okay. He says, because you are a holy people for Jehovah, your Elohim. That's why you can't do just anything that these people are doing. He says, you are not to boil a young animal in its mother's milk. This shows the understanding of being compassionate to even the animals. Every year, you must take one-tenth of everything your seed produces in the field. So Moses is kind of jumping back and forth to different subjects because he's trying to get it all in. And he does repeat himself. But it's important that we understand that the, as he's going through these things, this understanding, as the revelation comes, he's going to give it to the people because he's speaking on his perception of how these things are to occur. Every year and eat it in the presence of Jehovah your Elohim in the place where he chooses to have his name live. We know that's Jerusalem. You will eat the tenth of your grain, new wine, olive oil, and the firstborn of your cattle and sheep. Remember, you're going to get that as an offering, and then part of it you will be given that you can eat in part of your festival during this time of while you're there in Jerusalem. But then he's going on and he's going to tell you, but if the distance is too great for you so that you are unable to transport it because the place where Jehovah chooses to put his name is too far away from you, then when Jehovah your Elohim prospers you, you ought to convert it into money. Take the money with you. Go to the place which Jehovah your Elohim will choose and exchange the money for anything you want, cattle, sheep, wine, other intoxicating liquor, or anything you please, and you ought to eat those there in the presence of Jehovah, your Elohim, and enjoy yourselves, you and your household. So if the distance is too great, then you're able to sell that to surrounding people. You can sell that, but that money you take and you set that aside, that doesn't belong to you, that belongs to Jehovah. You set it aside and make certain that you take it 
one at one of those three festivals and present it either at the temple or by those animals. If you want to partake of an animal while you're there, then at that particular point in time, you will buy that animal, but it wasn't supposed to be done in the temple. These things will be to be done outside the temple area in an area that the Levites could handled. So that's why Yeshua threw the money changes out of the temple because they were doing all of these things in the temple ground itself. And that was not supposed to happen. It could be done outside of the temple ground, but not in the temple ground. Verse 27, you don't neglect the Levite staying with you because he has no share of inheritance like you. So he keeps going over this and guess what? That's exactly what the children of Israel did. They forgot about the Levites <laughs> and the Levites had to take care of themselves. Look at this, what Jehovah has set in place. At the end of every three years, you are to take all the tenths of your produce from that year and store it in your towns. In other words, where the Levites live, in the cities around the areas where the Levites are living, you take that tent and give it there to the Levite. Then the Levite, because he has no share or inheritance like yours, along with the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow living in your towns, will come eat and be satisfied. So this is how you took care of the poor and everybody else. By giving to the Levites, and the Levites would then in turn bless and have a place for those people that they could come. He says, So Jehovah your Elohim will bless you in everything your hands produce. So this is part of the what? The blessing. If you are obedient to what Jehovah has spoken to you to do, then he will continue to what? Bless you in accordance with the promises that he has made. Chapter 15. Then he goes into the Shemitah. Remember, that's the seventh year. Every seven years. He says, every creditor is to give up what he has loaned to his fellow member of the community. He is not to force his neighbor or relative to repay it because Jehovah's time of remission has been proclaimed. So in the year of Semita, all debts were paid. So that person then would not owe a debt. And of course, they tried to do that in our bankrupt system, bankruptcy system that we use in this country. You may demand that a foreigner repay his debt, but you are to release your claim on whatever your brother owes you. In spite of this, there will be no one needy among you because Jehovah will certainly bless you in the land which Jehovah your Elohim is giving you as an inheritance to possess. So when you are obedient, when you write that debt off and give that person a fresh start, then Jehovah will what? He will bless you because you're doing what is right in his eyes. If only you will listen carefully to what Jehovah your Elohim says, says and take care to obey all these commands I am giving you today. Yes, Jehovah, your Elohim will bless you as he promised you. You will lend money to many nations without having to borrow, and you will rule over many nations without their ruling over you. If someone, verse 7, if someone among you is needy, one of your brothers in any of your towns in your land, which Jehovah, your Elohim, is giving you, you are not to harden your heart or shut your hand from helping, giving to your needy brother. No, you must open your hand to him and lend him enough to meet his need and enable him to attain what he wants. Guard yourself against allowing your heart to entertain the mean-spirited thought that because the seventh year, the year of Semita is at hand, you will be stingy towards your needy brother and not give him anything. For then he will cry out to Jehovah against you, and it will be your sin. So it's a sin, Jehovah says, through Moses, it's a sin not to help your brother, no matter when it is that he cries for help. Verse 10, rather, you must give to him, and you are not to begrudgingly when you give it to him. You got to be a cheerful giver. If you do this, Jehovah your Elohim will bless you in all your work and everything you undertake. That's a blessing. The curse is, of course, you squeeze your hand too tight, then Jehovah will let even what you have just slip through your hands. He says, 
poor, there will always be poor people in the land. That is why I'm giving you this order. You must open your hand to your poor and needy brother in your land. Let's go on, verse 12. If your kinsman, a Hebrew man or woman, is sold, To you, he is to serve. Now, remember that soul is like an indentured servant because of a debt they cannot pay, or because they cannot pay, they can't pay a debt to someone else. They come to you and they become your servant for a time. He is to serve you for six years, but in the seventh year, you ought to set him free. Moreover, when you set him free, don't let him leave empty handed. <laughs> we highlighted that. Because even after the ridiculous and evil practice of slavery in this nation, you weren't supposed to be just set free. That's where what? The Freedom Bank and all those things were set up so that our ancestors, the ancestors of African-Americans that had gone through slavery were to get the 40 acres and a mule, the land, and a fresh start in this land. And that, of course, never happened. He said, but you supply him generously from your flock, threshing floor, and wine press. From what your over your Elohim has blessed you with, you are to give to him. So you don't just let him go after his time of servitude is over. You're giving him a fresh start. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and your over your Elohim redeemed you. That is why I'm giving you this order today. But if he says to you, I don't want to leave you because he loves you in your household, and because his life with you is a good one, then take an hour, we're gonna pierce his ear through, right into the door, and he will be your slave forever. Do the same with your female slave. So if that is the case, then you have to take him to the judges, and he has, he has to then state that this is his desire in front of them. It ain't something you just do by yourself, because we know how evil man can be. No, you take him before the judges and he will proclaim as they're investigating, is this the truth? He will proclaim before them that this is what he wants to do. You will give him, you will pierce his ear and you can do the same with the female or the male. You will pierce the ear and put that ring in their ear. Don't resent it when you set him free. Since doing his six years of service, he has been worth twice as much as a hired employee. So here Jehovah is giving a value for what you are to set him free with, right? You're going to give him a good share to start his new life with. He says, then Jehovah, your Elohim, will bless you in everything you do. So when you are obedient, it will come back to you. Verse 19, all firstborn males in your herd of cattle and in your flock are to be set aside for Jehovah your Elohim. You are not to do any work with the firstborn. You are not to do any work with the firstborn from your herd or shear of firstborn sheep. Each year, you and your household are to eat it in the presence of Jehovah. So you're taking that tenth to the temple, Jehovah your Elohim in the place which Jehovah will choose. But if it has a defect, is lame or blind, or has some other kind of fault, you are not to sacrifice it to Jehovah your Elohim. Once again, the job of the priest were to make sure the animal was without spot or blemish. Whether you can eat that on your own property, the unclean and clean alike may eat it, that not the animal, that is the people, like the gazelle or the deer. You just don't eat its blood, but pour it out on the ground. That animal is not acceptable to Jehovah. So the next firstborn that without blemish, that is the one that you will take to the temple. Then he goes on. Whoop. Ah. Observe the month of Avi and keep, that's the first month. Those names came from Babylonian captivity, but it would be the first month of the year. And keep Pesach to Jehovah your Elohim. For in the month of Avi, Jehovah your Elohim brought you out of Egypt at night. That Ev. Aviv was put there by the scribes to describe this first month. But Moses would have said in the first month. You are to sacrifice the Pesach or the Passover offering from the flock and herd to Jehovah your Elohim in the place where Jehovah will choose to have his name live. You are to eat. You are not to eat any leaven with it. 
For seven days you are to eat with it matzah or unleavened, the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste. Thus you will remember the day you left the land of Egypt as long as you live. No leaven is to be seen with you anywhere in your territory for seven days. This is where they go through that, what has been known as that spring cleaning. But they were getting all of the leaven, any leaven products out of their homes. None of the meat from your sacrifice on the first day in the evening is to remain all night until morning. You may not sacrifice the Pesach offering in just any of the towns that Jehovah your Elohim is giving you, but at the place where Jehovah your Elohim will choose to have his name live. That's why there can't be a sacrificial animal now because there is no temple. And the only place that the animal could be sacrificed in the name of Jehovah was at the temple. There is where you ought to sacrifice the Pesach offering in the evening when the sun sets at the time of year that you came out of Egypt. So that would be in the first month. And now we're going to complete our chapter 16 portion and we will be complete with our lesson for today. You ought to roast it and eat it in the place Jehovah your Elohim would choose. In the morning you will return and go to your tents. For six days, you are to eat matzah or what unleavened bread. On the seventh day, there is to be a festive assembly for Jehovah, your Elohim. Do not do any kind of work. So it's all it's like a Sabbath. It is to be treated like a Sabbath. Uh, with the exception of doing this time, you will not have any leavened bread. So at the conclusion of the uh, festival of unleavened bread, there is a festival so everybody comes together again and in the city and have this joyous occasion then Moses goes on you are to count seven weeks you are to begin counting seven weeks from the time you first put your sickle to the standing grain you are to observe the festival of Shavuot or weeks we call it Pentecost now for Jehovah your Elohim with a voluntary offering which you are to give in accordance with the degree to which Jehovah your Elohim has prospered you. You are to rejoice in the presence of Jehovah your Elohim. This is a joyous occasion at the festival of Shavuot or what we call Pentecost now. That festival is a seven day festival and every male and many of the families would go along with the male to Jerusalem for this celebration. You are to rejoice in the presence of Jehovah your Elohim, you, your sons and daughters, your male, female slaves, and the Levites living in your towns and the foreigners, orphans, and widows. That's why during that time of year, there were millions of people in the city of Jerusalem and the surrounding areas, and they would try to come into the city and be around the temple doing that celebration. So they're celebrating all over. But the actual food or the sacrifice was done in the city around the temple. In verse 13, you are to keep the festival of Sukkot for seven days after you have gathered the produce of your threshing floor and rind press. Rejoice at your festival, you, your sons and daughters, your male and female slaves, the Levites and the foreigners, orphans and widows living among you. If you're doing that kind of thing, don't you think these people would want to know something about Jehovah, your Elohim? If they're part of this festival for seven days, seven days you are to keep the festival for Jehovah your Elohim in the place Jehovah your Elohim will choose because Jehovah your Elohim will bless you in all your crops and in all your work. So you are to be full of joy. Three times a year, all your men are to appear in the presence of Jehovah your Elohim in the place which he will choose at the festival, festival of Matzah, at the festival of Shavuot, and at the festival of Sukkot, which is Booths. They are, you are not to show up before Jehovah empty-handed. Bring, it's a festival. So you're gonna bring something to share. But every man is to give what he can in accordance with the blessing Jehovah your Elohim has given you. And so Moses is recounting these things for the children of Israel, going over and over and repeating himself in some areas because he wants them to understand 
his perception of the instructions that Jehovah had given him to give to them. Now let's look at some of this right before we close our lesson out. Moses is, has admonished not to be lured by the heathen abominable practice of the king. You're not supposed to bring in these practices of ultra cult, other cultures into the holy understanding of the land of Israel. Those pagan practices are not to be done there because it's holy land. Now, wherever we are as part of these other cultures, of course, you can't determine what they're going to do for their practices. But those are not to be things that you are supposed to do. You are to remain true to the Torah, neither adding to or subtracting from its laws. A person professing to be a prophet who claimed to bring instruction from Jehovah to worship idols was to be put to death. An idol is anything other than what Jehovah has given you that you are to bless him and him alone. This is true even if the individual performs supernatural acts or accurately predicts the future. Sometimes they can get it right. So what? It's still an abomination to Jehovah, and you have to rid yourself from that kind of understanding. Moses commands the Israelite to designate every seventh year as a shemitah or a sabbatical year. During this year, creditors must forgive all outstanding loans. The section then discusses the obligation to give charity to the poor with a, what? A, Paul said you have to be a cheerful, a cheerful giver. Yeah, uh, we talk about here to the poor with a happy heart and to lend them money if necessary. Even in the Shemitah year is looming. A Jewish slave must be freed after six years. That's an indentured servant of service and must be given generous severance gifts as he departs. A fresh start. It's more than just saying, I don't have any debt. It's a fresh start. In other words, the reason you got debt was because you started with nothing. So if you could get a fresh start with clear your debt and give you substance, then you would hope that in this process, you would be able to what? Stay out of debt. Like it or not, Jehovah knows you to the core and the fiber of your being. And yet you are special, distinctive, and unique. We are a holy people. So that's why we're going through this. And I'm trying to point out to you, as Moses is pointing out to the children of Israel, that you're supposed to be different. You're not supposed to do things that Jehovah has told us not to do. He says, and yet, and therefore, the situations you encounter in life are divinely curated, not for your entertainment, but for your growth, and as a vehicle for greater connection and intimacy with Jehovah. What, whether you see a challenging situation as the blessing of growth waiting to happen, or the curse of bitter disappointment depends on you. You determine what you're going to do with this information. For it is when we are able to see, re to know and to appreciate our blessings that we are truly blessed. So you could have substance and enough, more than enough, but because you're not perceiving it correctly as a gift from Jehovah to be shared with others, then maybe that isn't your blessing. Hmm. So we go on, Moses was giving prophetic expression to the great paradox of faith. It is easy to speak to Jehovah in tears. It is hard to serve Jehovah in joy. That's why he keeps pointing out that you celebrate the joy of the festivals, reminding you that Jehovah has blessed you. And as you get yourself into the right frame of mind, then you understand the true value of the blessings that Jehovah has given to you. It is the warning he delivered as the people came within sight of their destination, the promised land. Remember, they can look over the Jordan and see the promised land. And Moses is trying to get them in the right frame of mind as they're going in to take this land. Once there, they were in danger of forgetting that the land was theirs only because of Jehovah's promise to them 
and only for as long as they remember their promise to Jehovah. So even the blessing of the Holy Land depends on your perception and your ability to follow the instructions of Jehovah, your Elohim. So I thank you so much for joining me. We have completed our lesson. We did it in the one hour's time. Let us pray, and I will see you next time when we go uh, Wednesday night for Lesson 48. Jehovah our Elohim, I thank you for this time. I thank you for the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit that has come to guide us into all truth, opening up our hearts and minds to receive all that you are saying to us as we go through your word line upon line and precept upon precept. I thank you and praise you now as we continue on our journey of this day. I thank you for the blessing of 56 years with the one that I love. I thank you for how richly we can look back and see the blessing that you have given each of us with one another. So we bless you and praise you for all that you do. You are a great God and a loving Father. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord, Savior, and King, we pray. Amen. All right, everyone, we're going to get out of this. Stop our shared screen. And I will see you on Wednesday night for our Wednesday night Bible study. Shalom.